speakers, uh, Dr. Kong and Dr. Marvi Nedla. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them. Pretty interesting profile. Mar is a two times tech, start tech founder, tech startup founder, a California based attorney. He is the founder and the host of the Autonomous Car with Markov podcast. I highly recommend you to watch that or listen to it. Um, he's the founder and the principal partner of Hawk Plus Co. Uh, which is a global autonomous vehicle mobility consulting company serving um, from um, California, Amsterdam, and Paris. He is um, a UCLA graduate uh, where he did his BA with heavy concentration in engineering. And what I really like, what I started with today is he, uh, what, what, what he says, he's very passionate about technology, autonomous vehicle, law, policy, and all those. And what he says is the greatest step change in humanity since the industrial revolution is autonomous vehicle. So that's Mark. And together with Mark, we have Dr. Martin Adler, who is our partner in uh, Hog Plus Co. And he is... An economist, he advises the European Commission, OECD, national and municipal public bodies and private inter enterprises like, uh, like Nissan and Dropbox. He holds a research position at uh, the VU University of Amsterdam. He has earned a number of prizes for his scientific uh, achievements, including um, International Transport and Economics Association and German Forum of Reg Regional Sciences. So uh, he's also an advisory body in International Advisory Board of La Marina de Valencia. He works as well as a leader in the Place Placemaking Europe network. Pretty impressive profile. Besides their amazing profile, besides their amazing profile, I really, really admire these two gentlemen because of their passion toward autonomous vehicle. I'm really excited because we often, when you talk about especially safety, we often stumble when it comes to the legal issues. And we are very careful, we don't want to make a legal statement. But today, we have these two gentlemen who's going to entertain us about this. Please be hand for Mark and Martin. All right. So here we are. <coughs> safety law and econ, fun stuff. So we'll kick it off with kind of a really high level set of topics, and then we'll kind of drive, to, you know, dive in and kind of unpack things little by little. Uh, but we thought it'd be kind of a neat idea, right, to kick things off with sort of an overview of where things are headed, because it's not really fun to study a thing unless you know why you're doing that thing, right? So the end result is what? You know, what's the end game for autonomous cars? Where are we going? Now, obviously, we started with the proxy using electric vehicles. Obviously, Elon was kind enough to crunch the numbers for us. And if you extrapolate out, you consider the total number of global vehicles in the world, the replacement rate, uh, or rather the production rate, I should say, of vehicles, um, then as a, as a lower mathematical bound, then perhaps in 25 years, we could replace all vehicles with electric. And again, we're using that as a proxy for autonomous, since virtually all electric cars tend to be autonomous and vice versa. Um, that's obviously just a mathematical, impractical lower bound, but it kind of sets the framework for at least what's theoretically possible, obviously not what's going to happen. Um, what you do end up with, though, is a conservative hopeful estimates, which is driven both by the further development, but indeed, hopefully, the, um, the helpful legal mandates throughout the world to fast track autonomous vehicle development and deployment, so that hopefully by the 2060s, 2080s, and that's kind of a pretty big delta, but hopefully by around that time, we should see the majority of human driven vehicles off the road. So that's kind of a neat thing to look forward to. It's it's pretty tangible, but here are the various things we want to discuss. So Martin, you're going to tackle most of the safety issues. I'll give you a background on the legal framework of things because one of the recurring questions is always, well, what happens if such and such happens? You know, what if somebody jumps in front of an AV? What if this happens, this, that, the other? The trolley paradox, which we'll discuss very briefly, and that's all. Um, and, you know, I just want to give you a bit of framework to show how the existing legal structure can be applied quite neatly to autonomous vehicles because we're not talking about an entire new field of law. We're basically just kind of remixing first year law school. So this then, of course, is the timeline for autonomous vehicles. Again, we're kind of extrapolating from everything we've heard here and there, and nobody really agrees with anybody on anything. So kind of use your imagination and take what you like, toss out what you don't agree with. But roughly speaking, this is probably what we're looking at. 
where level four deployment starts to occur sometime in the 2020s. We'll see some level five occurring maybe in the 2030s and be widespread, say by the 2050s-ish. Intel and others have anticipated something like a $7 trillion industry for all autonomous vehicle stuff, however broadly that's divide, uh, defined. Um, and then it's my genuine hope that indeed by the 2060s, we're gonna start to see legal mandate, which will really kind of uh, enable autonomous vehicles to really push human driven cars off the road once and for all. Yeah, all right. So in my capacity as an advising on traffic safety, I usually rather want to, you know, understand the grander scheme of things. And so like, what are we, how many deaths can we avoid? And I guess a lot of you are going to be familiar with the figures, like about 1.2 million deaths annually in the world. And then you have a higher number of serious injuries, 20 to 50 million. And then like minor injuries are going to go into hundreds of millions. And then like property damage are going to be even higher than that, right? So there's like a ranking of practically ratios of like something occurring and 94% uh, of them are uh, caused by human error. It like depends on which country you're talking about. It could be 93 to 97, I think, but uh, it doesn't really matter. What is actually interesting point, and I don't know, most of you are gonna have seen this already, right? It's practically the chance of dying by a certain thing happening to you. And you're not gonna be able to read it because it's probably very, very small, but I put those little errors on there. First one is like heart disease, cardiovascular good disease practically kills the majority of people eventually. But actually the first unnatural cause of death is road accidents. That's our like little error here. So you can see that practically of dying of an unnatural circumstance, practically your body not failing, the first chance of that is being removed by, uh, by traffic. So that's like, I mean, your guys are like practically gonna remove one of their biggest uh, causes of human death there is. And then I made another one, which is the second uh, little thing. And that's the second unnatural cause of death. You, so you see how far you have to go down to practically get to the second most likely unnatural cause of death. So you see that traffic is not the most safest thing to be involved in at the current state. And actually, if you break this down to number, then one in 77 people are going to be a road fatality. And that's 77 people right now, but we're kind of closing in on that number. So if we would reach 77 people, then we would have one in the exit, like in the room, who is going to practically eventually die, statistically speaking. If you talk about injuries, then you're already at the one in 20 chance to suffer a severe life-changing injury during traffic. We're definitely more than 20 here. So practically one of us is going to be severely affected, statistically speaking, by such an occurrence, right? Um, and that kind of demonstrates very, very clearly why we should consider this and why also even remote improvements on this issue. I mean, like we're always talking about like, you know, removing everybody, but like it just like 5% from a statistical economic perspective is like, would be beautiful. I mean, imagine how much 5% of 1.25 million is, you know? That brings me to another point of statistics. So a while back, I was working together with the OECD for the South Korean ministry or the Korean ministry on uh, reducing the number of pedestrian fat uh, fatalities in Korea. They are one of the unsafest countries in the OECD member countries to be walking, so don't really go there and like try to walk around that much next to the road. Uh, something to do with how fast they industrialize and then practically build roads. I think this is really relevant from the AV perspective because we're always saying that 94% of accidents are, are caused by human error. That's very, very true. But not all of those people are sitting inside a motorized vehicle. And if you're looking at statistics nowadays, you will see that up to half of the people are not sitting inside a motorized vehicle. Last year was the first year where more people died on a bicycle accident in the Netherlands than actually being in a motorized vehicle. And we're gonna see this also happening in other countries successively, right? Like in Germany, the, the number of cyclists is a bit lower, so it's not to that extreme. But when you're looking at who gets actually injured from cars, then it's a lot of people who are practically, you know, secondary. And then it's the question, okay, like if the car is not actually driving the bicycle or walking you, then how can you plan in for somebody just stepping out into the car lane and, you know, gone. Um, what was that sound? <laughs> no, 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 I'll let that do it then again. Um, so I think that if we're talking about, and we're hearing this in the last five years, we have heard this incredibly often that this 94% number, I don't think that should be the target. The target should be somewhere, I don't know, something realistic, and we should 
practically tell ourselves that even 5% is like already an incredible gain. And even so we can get closer maybe to the 94%, there will be still an interaction with people which are not inside an autonomous vehicle. And from my perspective also, we should always ask ourselves, because there will be regulation trying to, there is already regulation trying to separate the vehicle from, from the interaction with the pedestrian, but we should really worry about ourselves if we want that. And I would strongly advise against this because this has in the past not really reduced uh, or not really increased the well-being of citizens. And I'm saying about this because this is exactly what the, co the direction the Koreans went, right? So the Koreans have a high pace of uh, practically building roads. They were like, oh, this is going to be fine. We're just going to make a highway and then we're going to have this overpass and everybody's obviously going to use that overpass. Turns out that all the old people couldn't walk the stairs. So what they're trying, they're trying to cross a three-lane highway. And obviously that's not going to go really well, right? Another point maybe which this analysis talks about like in terms of safety regulation is that often when the interaction takes place, it has something to do with the with the foreshadowing of the consequences, right? So like, let's say you're on an intersection and one high, or like one direction of the intersection has an 80 kilometer speed limit and the other one has a 60 kilometer speed limit. Your brain will see one side of the cars go and you will think that the speed limit of the other side should be roughly the same. You will practically walk into this thinking that you can make it across. Like this is actually quite a frequent occurrence actually. This is one of the main determinants of South Korean pedestrian fatalities is practically not being able to foresee what the next likely event is going to be. If you reduce the number of traffic accidents and therefore the, the fatalities, then uh, what goes down is the, actually the cost of the accident. And what that means is that it goes down the cost of being in a car. And this will be not, not everybody perceives it as like, oh yeah, it's so, like, so much cheaper nowadays to go because I'm not going to get killed. But it's practically everybody saying like, yeah, now that we have AVs or now that we have a better safety feature, it's become so much safer and that, then I can send it. So like it's maybe not in the thought of the actual percentage or practically, I don't know, the euro amount lost, but it's a higher feeling of safety. And once you feel more safe, you're going to use that car more. And that brings us back to an economic proposition, which is called the rebound effect, which says that practically once you have a lower price, you're going to have an increase in demand and that increase in demand is going to put you almost back into the, the original position. So we're going to reduce traffic fatalities. That's going to make everybody think like, oh, it's so much cheaper. Let's use it. Right. And then practically because you use it more often, you have higher risk exposure, practically bringing us driving the accident numbers up. Again. This is a study from Infras, Swiss uh, organization, which were looking at a uh, cost of traffic in Germany. OK, and it's per kilometer basis. And then it's like practically uh, motorized vehicles. Uh, airplanes and then it's like according to the categories and I know you can't read it but uh, this is motorized traffic and like let's say like that the red one is the cost which comes through accidents so you can see that given all costs inside a kilometer you can see that a very high share of that is practically the possibility to being involved in an accident right so that the kilometer the average cost practically of traveling kilometer would go substantially down if you could reduce the chances of having an accident. And that is also why the WHO in, a, I want to say 2015, but maybe it's 2016, had a report where they were calculating on how much money is aggregate lost each year of practically having people suffer through accidents. And it's about 2%. So it's, it's a huge share. If you think about it, economic practically growth is roughly around the 2%. Right? You see to what extent practically this influences our productivity. But, enough excursion, I'll, I'll hand back to you. <laughs> <laughs> All of what I'm talking about is from the American point of view. We are not inventing a whole new body of law. We've got a really great framework, at least built on common law and everything else, which allows us to just adapt what we've got to existing scenarios. And what I mean by this is everybody says, what happens if an autonomous car or a person jumps in front of an autonomous car? Uh, what happens in this trolley paradox scenario? What happens if somebody uses an autonomous vehicle to drive through a crowd of pedestrians or to deliver a bomb somewhere. I mean, th these aren't new questions. We've been asking these questions since the beginning of time, the minute we had a, a wheel that could turn and carry something from A to B. So these aren't new questions. Um, what is interesting, and, and I'll get to those specific examples in a moment just to, to prove my point, but to begin with, what, what is really interesting though is we are gonna have some new definitions, right? So liability generally, and just sort of thinking out loud, so one can imagine 
that we're going to need at least four different types of, well, definitions, right? So you're going to hear me throughout the course of the evening referring a lot to the aviation world. I'm a hopeless aviation fanatic as well. You know, we, we no longer use the terms pilot and co-pilot or even captain and first officer. Rather, we use the terminology, the PF and the PNF. So the pilot flying and the pilot not flying. And so it seems pretty logical then that when we have autonomous vehicles, we're going to end up with something rather like this, an owner driver, uh, an owner non-driver, a non-owner driver, and the non-owner non-driver, which is of course the perfect passenger. And the reason why this matters is because, well, it, it sounds silly. Somebody's laughing here. I don't know why, but, it, but, but, but here's why it matters, right? Because everyone talks about this liability question, like, well, what happens if an autonomous car hits somebody or something? Well, I don't know. If they're not driving and they don't own the car, how can they be liable for anything? I mean, you're not liable as a passenger sitting in an airplane, right? So ultimately what's going to happen is we're just going to do what we do in aviation. We're going to go down through the entire chain of potential liability until we find the source. A great example of this that I love, and by the way, as an aside, this is why aviation is so incredibly safe. I've often said that an aircraft at cruising, cruising altitude is the safest place a human can be in the globe, on the globe, above the globe, whatever. Um, and this is amazing because one of the cool metrics you've all heard, I'm sure, is you know the mean time till failure for something. Well, the mean time to failure for a twin engine aircraft, both engines failing, is so vanishingly small, you can't even get a meaningful number out of it. I mean, these things are essentially, for lack of a better word, over-engineered bits of perfection. It's incredible. Um, nevertheless, there was a British Airways crash several years ago at Heathrow. Some of you might remember this. Uh, the issue was that there was some frozen fuel delivery system. And the question, of course, was, well, what went wrong? Well, obviously, as they should have done, they first looked to the pilots. There was nothing wrong there. So they went through all the various systems. They even were able to trace the fuel back, not just to the airport where they filled up the plane, all the way back to the oil refinery itself that produced the fuel. I mean, that's just cool. Well, as it turns out, that wasn't the issue. There was a mechanical failure in the plane. That's not the point. What is the point is that we can learn a lot from aviation, and that's why these definitions matter a lot. So let's touch really briefly. I'm not going to give you a crash course in first year law school, but look, these are really basic things in everyday life. Negligence, intentional torts, criminal acts, just running through them very quickly. I'm sure there's very familiar, similar things here in Germany and elsewhere besides. So for negligence, you just have to show that there was some duty that a reasonable person breached and that it actually caused the harm. There's a cool tangential thing called the emergency doctrine. If somebody did something out of an emergency situation, we say that that was probably okay. The textbook case is that a passenger in a taxi pulled a gun on the driver. The driver drove the car up onto the sidewalk into a brick wall. I think may have injured a pedestrian. That's not the point. The point was, would a reasonable person have done that sort of a thing? Would they have driven into a wall if a gun was pointed at their head? Well, yeah, the court said, that's pretty reasonable. It's called a panic reaction. So you look at that, you look at intentional torts, did somebody use an autonomous vehicle to injure somebody or you trespassed on property? That's a fun one because it turns out, at least in American law, the intentional tort of trespass doesn't even require the knowledge that you were entering onto somebody else's <coughs> property. Merely the intent to enter onto some property generally, and then that it happened to belong to somebody else, oh well, too bad for you. And so this raises the really interesting question, you know, so you've got an autonomous vehicle, it's level five. What happens if it turns around on somebody else's property? Well, who's liable? Is it the manufacturer of the vehicle? Is it the passenger who doesn't even own the car who programmed it? Is it the software company, the camera, the LiDAR company? These are the questions to be asking, not whether we can do it, but rather how to do it. Okay, there's the trolley. Can we just get this out of the way very, very quickly, please? This doesn't need to keep getting brought up. We don't need to discuss this over and over again. Uh, there's three. Does anybody not know the trolley paradox? Oh, okay. This is annoying, but here we go. <laughs> okay, so very, very quickly, the trolley paradox is something like this. Um, you've got a thing, a trolley, an autonomous car, whatever. Uh, it's driving along and suddenly there's a little kid crossing the road and there's a grandma and a grandpa crossing the road. So the car has, well, three options. It can either hit the little kid, it can hit grandma and grandpa, or it can drive off the cliff to avoid killing either grandpa or little kid and kill the occupants. Well, so that's the paradox, right? Because how is it supposed to decide? And here's why this is a completely useless discussion, although an admittedly awesome one inside of a philosophy classroom, which it is, but keep it in the classroom because look, three things. First of all, 
Um, has anybody ever here actually been driving along and thought to yourself, hmm, should I hit the grandma or the little kid? Like literally, have any of you ever actually been faced with this dilemma, ever? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, um, look, if any person or vehicle, artificial, natural, or otherwise, is ever in this scenario, it's already screwed up. There's something already fundamentally broken earlier on in the development of the system or of the person, I guess. Um, this should never even occur. I, I get it. Everyone's thinking, yeah, Mark, but these are corner cases, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but there's a difference between like an academic corner case and like a real world, some non-zero chance that this corner case could exist. My point is that this can't even exist. It's, it's just not, it's, even if it's possible, it's so highly improbable that it distracts from more important questions. Third and finally, as MIT demonstrated recently with a great study, we cannot, and as Martin so eloquently said on a podcast we did together, gosh, almost a year ago, wow, um, we cannot, or at least we must not, program AI into a vehicle. Uh, the MIT study basically found that in the US, for example, people tend to prioritize little children over grandparents. So again, at least in the US, it is not a defense. It's not, a, you cannot argue that you killed somebody because somebody pointed a gun at your head and said, hey, you must kill this person or we will kill you. That's, you, you can't make that argument. So in this case, yeah, that would literally be, how many of you are just in general in favor of AVs completely replacing human drivers one day? 30%, I would say, maybe yeah. 40 for the audience. So I'm guessing then that those of you who are in favor of AVs being mandated, how many of you think that AVs should will be or must be one day mandated. Okay. I mean, this is interesting. This is good. It's very good. It's good. <laughs> um, okay. Just to write that down, actually. Which then leads to the next question is connectivity, right? So again, it's a whole nother discussion to get into. Over the year updates, you're all familiar with Tesla and how they do software updates. The only car company in the world that does this. So, and this is a big question, right? Because let me, let's throw out the other question then, which is how many of you are in favor of over the updates generally, wireless connectivity generally? That's it. Oh, much more. Okay, that's better. That's good. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Although that's an interesting. 80%. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, yes. My overarching high level view, and this is strictly opinion, admittedly, but I really would like to share it. And for those of you who have heard the podcast, you frankly probably heard this before. At least speaking from the US point of view, and again, borrowing from what we've learned from aviation, we do eventually need an FAVA, literally a Federal Autonomous Vehicle Administration. So internationally, to complement the FAA, the Aviation Administration, you've got the IACO and the IATA. Um, and we need a similar thing for, for AVs, right? So, so, and here's why, right? So today, we don't even have such basic guidelines and standardizations for things like how to well, define anything, the, the design, the technology, whether LIDAR, computer vision, or what have you, um, safety issues, privacy issues with respect to over the year updates, security generally, how to deploy these things, how to test them, traffic issues, taxes issues. And this, this really matters a lot because, okay, here's another aviation example. So when Airbus first deployed and Indeed, when they were first testing their first aircraft, commercial aircraft, the, uh, the Airbus A300, it was the first civil aircraft to use fly-by-wire, which was a military technology. And well, nobody knew whether it was sufficiently safe. There were no guidelines. It's sort of like today, nobody knows whether computer vision is good enough, like say LIDAR, there's no set standards. I mean, we have standards even for things like how far your headlights go. Well, in the absence of standards, finally, the powers that be said, well, look, let's just see if your Airbus is at least as safe as Boeing. Okay, well, that's certainly not a bad way to go, I suppose. You've got some status quo, which is Boeing. Let's go with that. But the point is we don't have any of those. And I'm just sort of randomly tossing a bunch around for now because there's a lot of issues here. You can ask questions later if you like. Take traffic and taxes. Autonomous future presupposes that you have three components, right? You've got autonomous vehicles that are electric and that are shared. You cannot have just two of those three components, everything will break down, it'll just fail. And so then you start asking yourself the question, well, how do you make this work? Well, okay, one way is taxes, I suppose. Have an occupancy tax, don't let autonomous cars drive around empty, right? And there is precedent for this. London has congestion charges, in the US we have carpool lanes, which require that you have at least one or two passengers per car. So there's a lot of great precedent for all this stuff. We're not reinventing the wheel here. 
terrible pun, but you get my point. Okay, Martin, you should explain this beautiful slide you chose. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should. If we go forward into this AV future, or say, since we're going forward into this AV future, there's maybe five points which we want to discuss with you, but we don't actually have personally the answers. So those are open questions in a sense. The first one is maybe the, one of the understandable ones, but really, really out there. It's uh, the use of AI in autonomous vehicles, right? Like machine learning, whatever. And what are the implications then for that car? Because all of a sudden, practically, it's not something you fully programmed. And so practically, it can do anything with you, essentially, if the coding is not correct. And then that in combination, so that practically introduces a one risk pool, which is the question, do we actually want that or we don't, do we not want that? And the second one is associated, but not fully, is uh, to what extent do we want to be, since 80% of you agree with over the air updates, to what extent are we afraid that practically cars are used adversely against certain people who are using them, either a nation state or a smaller region or whatever. I mean, especially since we are already in a time frame where people are using technology to hurt other people. And I, I put a picture of uh, Fate of the Furious. I think it's the only movie I know where, <laughs> where cars are weaponized. And uh, yes, I, I don't know how many have seen the, the movie. For me, that beckons the question, if it is really true that you can actually have a steer an entire fleet, then from a regulator's perspective, it becomes a question on if the car, like right now, streets are critical infrastructure and therefore remain in the domain of the state, right? As do water appliances and therefore and energy. And then you have special regulation. Once you have a car fleet which you control as a single entity, let's say the car manufacturer or the fleet provider or the service provider, and let's say the transportation is one of the most crucial aspects of everybody's life, then Clearly, as a government who you know that this can be influenced, it becomes critical infrastructure. And then clearly there is regulation which is going to follow to that. It's my personal opinion. I don't know if you share this with me. Once you also bundle those little cars up into a fleet which you control, then what you do is practically you pool risks, right? Because before everybody could do what they wanted and they had all their little uh, risk themselves. And if you pool a risk, then it becomes a question of insurance or who's going to pay in the end if you really mess this one up. And there was a KPMG study in the 2015 or something like that among insurers, um, which asked insurance providers to what extent they feel, felt prepared for AVs. <laughs> and uh, 68, so almost 70% uh, responded that they had no budget for such a, such a discussion. Um, <laughs> 74 percent said they were not ready. And... Uh, 84%, but on the other hand, 84% of them thought it would have a significant impact on their revenue which stream. <laughs> yeah, which is like, we don't have money. You know? okay. Speaking of which, though, we should ask that question as well. Do you, who thinks that AVs are going to destroy the insurance industry? Or destroy or at least alter it substantially? Nobody. No, no, nobody thinks AVs will have any impact on the insurance industry? Okay, good. Okay. Who, who do you think, and how many think it'll harm the insurance industry? I mean, harm is also a Yeah. So, yeah, because we've talked about this a lot, obviously, and it sounds like many of you have thought about it. So, the, at least the general idea that I have certainly is that it's actually going to, if insurance companies do it right, it's going to be great because you're basically shifting the burden to much deeper pockets. If you don't have to deal with pesky humans, it's just a bunch of big, rich companies. This is really great for the insurance industries. Uh, an analogy for this is, of course, same thing with certain businesses, right? So a lot of people ask what's going to happen to sort of freeway side motels or hotels. So in the US, we have a chain called Motel 6. They're really awful, but they are cheap. They work, they have a bed-ish. Um, and so the idea is that, look, these, these Motel 6s could eventually just sort of white label their own AV pod cars and kind of evolve with the times. Instead of staying at a stationary box on the side of the road, you can stay in a, well, a box with wheels and continue on to your destination. Lufthansa does this with their shuttle buses. I know because my wife and I took it here to Munich from the airport. So this is not really, this doesn't require a huge leap of imagination. You were sleeping on a shuttle bus? No, 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 it was 20 minutes from the airport. <laughs> 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 so profitability goes up if like chance of like failure goes down from the insurance perspective. So that far we know. So we know that actually the profitability goes show, go up, but obviously they're forced to practically negotiate with much larger partners, right? And also from the car manufacturing side, I mean, 
which some of you or most of you are in, it becomes the question of why don't I provide the insurance? If I have already the statistical data on how my quickly or how likely my car is failing, I mean, that's the relevant information. You need to make it your own business. And if you are guaranteeing anyway that this car is going to arrive safely, which I mean, Tesla is doing by paying out everybody who gets injured by one, then why wouldn't you just like practically say like it's one service? Why wouldn't you just come and say like, you get into my car, you're fully insured during the entire trip of the travel. If you take such a huge risk as a provider, then you're kind of moving into the area of, I guess, which the airline industry is in, right? Then you're going into the area of Boeing and then like unforeseen events might practically be, have implications which might actually, you know, threaten the survival the survivability of your firm, right? Especially if you can be in the past, from the past be sued now into the future of a lot of cases which you have been trying to hide. Usually that's how it goes. And uh, then another example which comes from the car industry, and I guess most of you remember the Takata, Takata incident, right? I mean, so you have a number of people who are providing you, and I mean, you were showing this beautifully earlier. You have so many like people who are involved into the same kind of architecture, delivering parts to each other, and arguably one could say that an AV car is a more complex car than a regular car, right? And if you have this, then, I mean, who is ultimately taking the responsibility to themselves and saying, like, okay, no, this was a component which failed. No, yeah, that's the result, right? And then, I mean, you remember what happened to Takata. They practically went bankrupt. And then it's ob obviously the, the next in line who is going to take this responsibility. So moving forward, practically, do you assume a lot more responsibility as a, as a car manufacturer? And there comes the question then, do you go the way which you usually would? Do you go reinsure yourself? Do you take out big insurances, go to a reinsurer and try to practically pool that risk? As an economist, I would think probably. Now those three are all together. There are three more practically. The one is the safety paradox that what we discussed earlier already somewhat, but it's not the same safety paradox. It's a secondary one, right? Earlier we had the idea that there would be a rebound in demand, which would increase the number of people getting hurt again, because there's just more AVs driving around, there's more use. This safety paradox says, sees it more from the other side of the person uh, be interacting with the car. And it is practically, let's say you are a cyclist and you know that 60% or 70% of the cars are AVs and you know that they're programmed to stop, right? Then you're gonna start doing stuff you're going to just pull in front of it because you know it's going to stop, right? So you practically, we as humans, we're going to ad start adopting our behavior towards the much more safer car. Actually, I should add to that. So in California, we have a law that I think is pretty flawed yeah. where pedestrians have universal right of way. No matter what happens, the pedestrian is not at fault. And so what this ends up, the, the secondary effect of this, and I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up, <laughs> is how many times you'll see like, a parent pushing their baby stroller on their head for AirPods, looking down, not looking at the cars going by. I'm not joking, this happens every day and nobody looks. And I mean, I don't know, I was raised, you know, like make eye contact with the driver, don't cross until you actually see the whites of their eyes. And nobody does this anymore. So to your point though, yeah, yeah that's, that's, we can kind of imagine that sort of a future. It's, yeah. a, it's a weird question. This has been like, it's almost like a universal law. It always is true, right? We have continuously as a species throughout time adopted our behavior towards the risk we are facing. If you think about like skiing, for example, the better the technology became, the, the crazier we went on them. So well, this is why the safest car in the world <coughs> would have no seatbelts, no airbag, just a metal spike in the middle. That was one of my <laughs> what, first. What's the spike for? I was wondering. Well, because if you hit the brakes and you crash, it'll go right through your skull. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very safe here. No, no, our, our, our econ professor at UCLA, that was one of his first lessons to us. I don't remember what the lesson was, but the story stuck. Uh, well, okay, so, so here's the point, though, is that having tried it many times late at night, an hour's drive, uh, it's midnight, you get sleepy, and it's pretty alarming because you realize you could very easily fall asleep just because it's that good until it isn't. Um, but it is really good, and... And it's weird, right? Because in a regular car, you're probably going to be more, I don't know, what you're, less like, yeah, I guess, like it or not, you are less attentive. Are you inattentive? No, but you are certainly less attentive. Um, but in a regular car, yeah, you're much more attentive and you're therefore less likely to sleep. The ironic thing is, in a regular car, though, if you do fall asleep, you're dead, game over. Like, that's just how it is. But in a Tesla, you may actually survive. And indeed, people around you may survive as well. So it's a very weird 
kind of, I don't even know what word to use. It's, it's Indeter- a weird... Indeterminate state, maybe? That. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the Schro- Schrodinger's cat, but like inside it. That's yeah. Like. And that, I guess, brings us also to, already to the fourth point, that um, since we adjust our behavior, um, and since you don't as a car provider or as the regulator want people to go completely nuts in their behavior, you kind of have to have some sort of supervision of what the person does, right? You want to practically say it was the pedestrian's fault who stepped right in front of the highway, in front of that AV and got hit eventually. And the only way of proving that is going to be practically with recording data and practically recording a lot of data. And this might not be as much of a problem in California, but you know that it is a huge problem in Germany, right? So it practically violates a lot of the laws which we have passed in the, like, so practically there's a strong, you know, divergence about what you would want to have for a safe operation and what you can potentially do. Ah, yeah, and then we come back to the same point which we made earlier. Once cars are that safe, how long as a, like, let's say that cars eventually in 2040s, 2050s, 2060s, AVs are that safe. How long can you withhold making them actually mandatory? Right? Because like, I mean, freedom only goes so far, but once you start inflicting pain on other people, then as a government, usually that's exactly the step where you go in and you practically make it illegal to practically do something so unsafe. And so you can also clearly also see why this would be very, very attractive as a government to to make it mandatory at a certain point. Also, cars are a bit different to anything else in the world, right? <clears throat> There's a very deep-rooted cultural thing that we have with cars. Yeah. Different countries in different ways, but there is that link. Now, never mind the fact that once you have an autonomous car, purely autonomous, I think that emotional bond will, will be somewhat severed. <clears throat> but the quite, Apple? Huh? Even if it's an Apple? Probably not if it's an Apple, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but I think the question becomes, how do we compel people to make that change? And when you think about it, what has been the biggest driver, the biggest motivator of cultural change through history? Film, movies, pop culture, right? So it goes from smoking is cool to smoking is not cool. James Bond no longer gets drunk through his movies. I mean, movies have a really profound change on society. It sounds silly to say it, but it's really quite true, actually. And more broadly speaking, well, social media generally. <clears throat> so. When you think of it that way, I think, you know, I used to joke that James Bond will eventually have an electric car. And of course that's happening and how much you want to bet that electric car will be autonomous, right? And so I think, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, I think a lot of this phase shift, which will also help, um, I guess, motivate uh, regulatory change and to mandate AVs will actually come with a big social component. People are gonna need to push for this and the rest will follow. These are some questions that we just thought at a high level are worth kind of opening up to the audience. You know, at a high level, we can kind of kick things off like this if we have some time for discussion, which we have some time, right? How much time do we have? Five minutes-ish. Okay. Um, But alternatively, if anybody has any direct questions you want to ask, just throw them our way. Yeah, I guess the point of this slide is also to say that while we're discussing safety and security, then going back to Mark's famous statement, we should never underestimate the tremendous changes that autonomous vehicles are going to hold for, for our, the way we live, right? So like transportation is always an under underthought component. But if you think about like another driver of like a change in human society was clearly mobility, right? Like the speed of which you can transport people and goods is practically probably one of the determinants of economic growth and also of societal development. And practically our capacity to connect and then exchange idea is practically the underlying crucial determinant of how quickly we can develop as a species. Yeah, and speaking of which, we didn't even touch on the really big topics of economics, things like, for instance, well, two in particular, right? So one of them is what happens to commercial truck drivers and taxi drivers? I mean, this is so commonly discussed, it's almost become a throwaway thing. Like, oh, what about these people? But like everyone says it, but nobody comes up with a solution. Um, Similarly, I had a really great guest on the podcast. He has a real estate firm in San Diego. And I asked him this big question, which is, <clears throat> what's going to happen to the price of housing in the suburbs? And it seems that the default reaction seems to be what you suggested earlier today when we were talking, which is, how did you put it? That, that the suburbs will actually go down in price, right? Because... That really depends on the regulation. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. That was you we were talking. Sorry. I'm, no, no, no. Still, I, was, I was wondering, down, like... Still jet <laughs> uh, But yeah, we were, we were talking about this earlier, right? And the idea was that they'll go down in price. 
And, and my belief is actually rather the opposite. They're going to up in price because now there's no downside to living in the suburbs because the very concept of commuting won't even be a thing anymore. It's not going to be a hassle. It won't be a problem. So suddenly, if suburbs go up in price, where are people going to, where will be the more affordable places how, to live? How far is the suburb out? I think that's the question. Well, yeah, but, but the interesting thing is that depending on how you define either an autonomous car or even a room to your home, yeah. which depending on your definition that an autonomous car basically would be, yeah. you're basically blurring the line between your, your bedroom and the, right? So, so it just raises an interesting question of what's it going to do all these, these, these economic issues. But, that's very good. All right, thank you so much, and we'll have a thank you, guys. In this podcast show, we bring in the industry leaders and experts in the automotive domain to share their experiences along their journey. The mission of our podcast is to start a dialogue that will allow us to understand the development of automotive industry and where the automotive industry is going. You can ask questions to our guests directly. Just send us an email to podcast at matrix.de. We'll schedule a call with you during the recording and you'll be part of our show. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any new episodes. Please share this video to help others get enlightened as well and that would mean a great deal to us. See you in the next episode.